Thank you for everyone present here today. Thank you for Georgetown and to this uh, beautiful center for incubating this important project. And <clears throat> after a long journey, finally we have a book. It is with us. I just got a copy from it. It is beautiful, and I'm sure it's very, very interesting. I'm enthusiastic to read it. Uh, this talk is labeled as a keynote, but in reality it is a Please, I would like you to consider them as opening remarks. And I thought hard about them, and it took me a lot of time, many drafts, and finally I've decided to label them or call them From Exceptionalism to Singularity, the Maghrebi Experience in Contemporary Perspective. I know that today we will be deliberative, it will be a deliberative day, a long day, so I, would, I do not want to burden you with excessive academic discussion. Above all, I would like to welcome you all here to this workshop, which represents the culmination of a rich intellectual journey. That journey, as Professor King just entailed, began in 2015, when he and Professor Abstel Ghraoui and other interlocutors began to organize a conference to explore the contemporary politics of the Maghreb. <coughs> the resulting endeavor, in April 2016, brought about or brought together an impressive circle of scholars in a packed workshop here to engage the Maghreb's social, economic, and political currents. The contributors to this uh, uh, project have become now authors of a very chapters which have now come to fruition. And I just said that book. At the same time, I am deeply intimidated by the knowledge in this room. Many of you knew this area's empirical nuances and deep theoretical contours better than I do. So with that in mind, let me represent just, or present just a single idea as a reflection upon our discussion. I present that idea not as an academic technician or expert, but as a private citizen, a Maghrebi citizen, a Moroccan citizen from a unique vantage point as a scholar and witness who has watched this region evolve over the decades. There has long been an idea lurking in political circles and in political discourse within the Arab world and even within academic circles about Maghrebi exceptionalism. By exceptionalism, I mean the notion that no North African states do not follow the general pattern of the Middle East or of other modernizing countries. Instead, the Maghreb continue, countries evolve to their own pace due to their own cultural specificity. Or at least, this is how the argument goes. In the past, the argument for Maghreb exceptionalism has been leveraged, of course, as you know, by various actors in the service of anti-democratic projects. France invoked this belief as a justification for colonial rule it would again exploit it in consequent decades by insisting that it was stability and order, not political transformation that was craved and sought for by societies of North Africa. Let us not forget the quintessential declaration of former President Jacques Chirac, who a decade before the Arab Spring proclaimed in Tunis, in front of Tunisians, that Tunisians wanted bread and food not freedom, not human rights. Such a statement came up from the president of the birthplace for enlightenment. Ironically, many analysts reacted to Tunisian democratization by claiming that it was the country's exceptionally tolerant and liberal character <coughs> that preordained it, preordained it for political transition, preordained, predetermined the Jasmine Revolution. So it seems Exceptionalism never dies. <laughs> Likewise, during and after the Arab Spring, even as Tunisia underwent its revolutionary changes, the Moroccan and Algerian regimes insisted that they remain unique in their inherent resilience and durability in face of this regional turmoil. The Algerian version of exceptionalism has entailed a different set of considerations that a centrally planned economy geopolitically neutral stance and espoused 
third worldism, born out of revolutionary origins, make the country an unlikely candidate for revolutionary turmoil. Accessionism in Morocco has rested upon the persistence of the monarchy. The royal regime is framed as an essential, mysterious, even orientalist panacea to the needs of Moroccan society, which makes the country resistant to change. As another example, observers have sometimes suggested that Islam and Islamism in North Africa are exceptions in its moderate character and historical practice. This broader notion of Maghrebi exceptionism may also partly stem from post-colonial discourse, which deeply permeated how generations of Westerners would look upon or sympathize within the struggles <laughs> in the Arab world. It was in turn instru instrumentalized by certain French elites and their autocratic counterparts in the Maghreb. Yet now, nearly a decade after the Arab Spring, and as we see the latest wave of political changes occurring in Algeria, it has become clear that Maghrebi exceptionism is an idea that needs recalibration. What I propose is that we see North Africa not as exceptional, but as singular. There is a Maghrebi singularity we can observe today, one defined not by its insularity from other Arab uh, events or some immutable traits within these societies in the region, but rather by the way in which structural forces combine and recombine in a constant dynamic to shape the region. Indeed, the Maghreb is a microcosm of the Arab world. Herein lays its singularity. In the North African states alone, we can capture the dramatic cross-case variations that typify wider regime traits. We see both monarchism versus <coughs> republicanism, democracy versus authoritarian rule, centralized political orders uh, versus collapsing states, secularism versus Islamism, rentier economies versus resource poor development. The list goes on, of course. Within this one sub-region, we have extraordinary diversity. Perhaps the only commonality <coughs> shared by the Maghrebi states is language. Everyone else in the Arab world agrees that our different national dialects are equally unintelligible to all. There's much to unpack here at the nexus of Maghreb singularity. I would like to focus on just one aspect, namely the possibilities of democratic change at the macroanalytic level. Let me consider a subset of the Maghreb, namely Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, which are the countries I know intimately. In Tunisia, as we know, there is an electoral democracy that is in the process of consolidation as it struggles to establish institutionalized rule of law and horizontal accountability. Its democratization in 2011 was never supposed to happen, given the repeated claims of Maghrebi or Tunisian exceptionalism, as I just referred to, used and referred to by elites in its support to the Ben Ali regime. Much like the third wave of democracy, Tunisian democracy was conceived through pact between competing political actors. In this case, those competing actors were Islamists and secularists. Divided by an ideological discord, yet unable to conquer one another, Tunisia's Islamists and non-Islamist parties cooperated through coalition governments to lay the groundwork for its democratic transition, including the design of institutions, elections, and constitutionalism. This path was neither easy nor perfect. The bargains were fraught with tensions, as we all know, and nearly broke down several times, threatening the very transition. Moreover, economic struggles, transitional justice issues, deep corruptions, and, and issues centered around corruptions have burdened this transition. Still, Tunisia may well reveal that the most advantageous mode of democracy or political transition in the Middle East is pacted democracy. As such, it may be intellectually valuable and beneficial to re-engage the comparative study of these processes or these type of transitions. This has resulted in an extraordinary fact unmentioned in the Arab media. When Tunis hosted its 30th Arab League summit last month, it marked the first time that Arab League had ever met in a functional Arab democracy. Algeria today 
presents a different set of dynamics and considerations. We see from the events still unfolding, Algerians have been rebelling against two political constraints for years. The first, of course, is the ghost of the civil war in the 1990s and the long chilling effect its legacy has had on popular mobilization and political pluralism. In many ways, the uprisings today show the country is catching up to Morocco and Tunisia in terms of having its Arab Springs. More deeply, it is catching up to its own past by picking up where it left off in 1988 as it was the forerunner to all these revolts. <coughs> the second constraint, of course, is the militarized authoritarianism that has defined Algeria since independence, one where the armed forces ruled behind the facade of civilian rule. The Bouteflika era was a modest reconfiguration of these arrangements as the former president carved out a small realm of executive power by drawing up new business elite, incorporating them in the leadership and reshuffling the security services. In rejecting Bouteflika, however, and the wider autocratic system, Algerians also also rejecting three forms of escapism that long shaped politics of their country. These were immigration to Europe, as we in the Maghreb in Morocco and Algeria and Tunisia would call the phenomenon of Harig or Haraga, the turn towards Islamism, or disconnecting altogether and living on the margins. Algerians term those who did the latter as hitist, meaning those who lean upon the wall. What we see today is a reversal of these trends in which many citizens start to exit politics and the political trauma through existential disengagement. This political moment marks Bouteflika's downfall today, but also the military's return. It is a transition, a political moment, but not necessarily a democratic one, as protesters continue to push against the state. In response, Algerian military is trying to learn from its arch nemesis, the Moroccan Makhzen. It is mirroring the Makhzen. Facing popular contestation, its reaction will be an attempt to recycle the system and make it perpetuate behind a civilian facade. This brings us to Morocco, where the Makhzen is also observing events in Algeria with apprehension. If the Algerian upris uprising results in genuine political transformation, it will find itself in an awkward position, as it will be alone clinging to a past order. Morocco's politics exudes different stereotypes of Maghribi exceptionalism. Here, the monarchy and institutions have been justified or presented as pillars of Moroccan order, which are the result of impervious to revolutionary currents and democratic demands from below. This, as we know, is misleading. Morocco experienced wide-scale rioting in the 1960s. Two military coups that failed but that have nearly deposed the monarchy. Political mobilization in the 1980s marked by riots in urban cities, and the 1990s, and during the Arab Spring, a new wave of grassroots protests. More recently, as society has been atomized, up, uh, uh, uprisings have become more localized. The Reef movement represents the latest example. As vibrant protesters there since 2016 reflect political anger, regional marginalization, and grassroots demands for dignity. On the one hand, the Moroccan state retains familiar tools for retaining power against political parties. It has long engaged in co-optation or else legal marginalization. Meanwhile, against Moroccan civil society, which has become the true vocal for political change, the state has become more intolerant. While it has not espoused a purely counter-revolutionary mentality, as many of its monarchical counterparts in the Gulf or Egypt, the regime has become more rigid and stiffer in its attitudes towards civic dissent. It has also deployed a new tool within the repertoire of control, namely leveraging the judiciary itself to silence its most hardened critics. <coughs> The plight of many NGOs and social organizations such as reef protest movements, press organizations like Freedom Now, cultural associations like Hassim, this all now shows that the Moroccan Mahzen remained 
relentless in controlling dissenting options. On the other hand, Moroccan society is as resilient as the state. Its youth generations, as well as civil society, remain able to continually recalibrate their responses to pressures from above. They know that historically, the monarchy is not impervious to change. How can we interpret these changing tides that undermine the notion of Morocco exceptions? I would invoke two famous paradigms here by which social scientists have viewed political order in my country. The first is John Waterbury's theory of elite segmentation, which emphasizes how institutionally creating networks of dependency, segmentation, patronage, and clientelism has been a deliberate strategy by which <coughs> the Mahzen keeps the political class under control. The second is Abdullah's Hamoudi's theory of master and disciple, which suggests ancient cultural and religious foundations upon which Moroccans are expected to submit their obedience and authority to centers, power holders. Today, both optics need retweaking. Economic underdevelopment and pressures have meant that there is precious little patronage and resources left to fuel the segmentation of elites into networks of clientelistic dependency, and also that political institutions created to enshrine culture and religious obedience are unable to reproduce and sustain themselves in the face of massive popular pressure. In sum, the rules of political engagement in Morocco are shifting. These three vignettes of Tunisia, Algeria, and Morocco show a common thread. Prior to the Arab Spring, they all had Jacobin type states defined by a high degree of centralized authoritarianism. At the same time, they also allowed for very limited pluralism, which was exploited when necessary. Today, we see these old survival strategies as no longer working. Indeed, an intelligent question may not be so much if change is coming, but rather when and how and what cost, at what cost, based on the Tunisian and Algerian experiences. My sense rooted in Maghrebi singularity and its representation of wider Arab politics is that democratization may come if it is pacted. Democracy will not come from above. It will only be pushed from below, but ultimately must be shaped by institution institutionalized through compromise between competing actors. There are many competing groups and forces with claims to power in the Maghreb. Some have been historically suppressed, while others have remained in power for decades. If there is a popular rupture, it will be up to these competitors and actors to forge a mutual understanding in order to create a shared political order and a path forward. If we see such positive changes, catalyzed in this way, perhaps in some years, we will be talking not about Maghrebi exceptionalism or singularity, but rather Maghrebi leadership in the Arab world in terms of its democratic character. And that is a reality worth studying. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.